Welcome to I Can Science That. Today, let's science angular momentum. You may have heard before the conservation of angular momentum. You've probably heard this in terms of an ice skater pulling their arms in and you see that they spin much faster. But have you heard that there's someone out there who's convinced that this is fake? Here's a little bit of a different look at science denial. This won't be flat earth this time, just an example of how this same idea crops up in different ways. So let's take a look at the claims uh, of one individual who is just adamant that angular momentum is not conserved. I don't like to do debunks on this channel, but I don't want this to be a complete straw man. So let's see the original video where the original claim is made that the angular momentum is not conserved by the demonstration. And I reduce the radius from this point here to this point here, which is one tenth, then I should achieve 12,000 RPM. That's what science predicts. Let's try it. So he starts the spinning and he will reduce the radius and I think we can see it didn't go as fast as predicted. We just heard the individual say that he was anticipating a 12,000 RPM result. So let's see where the calculations lead us to that number. Here's the original equation for conservation of angular momentum. And this was the equation we were going to use for a point particle spinning on the string. So we're going to call the mass, the red mass on the end of that string. That was a point particle, and this should be a good enough approximation for that. If we simply plug in the this equation in here for I, we'll get this. The masses can drop out. And let's express that now as ratios. Ratio expressing uh, the, the ratio of the final angular speed to the original angular speed as an equation, um, as a ratio of the original radius to the final radius. And that's what we get. So plugging in the numbers, we heard the gentleman say that uh, his estimate for the radius change was going to be a 10 to 1 ratio and his estimate for the starting speed was two revolutions per second. If we run with that, we will get an, a predicted value of 200 revolutions per second. Uh, and that is equivalent to 12,000 RPM. Now, 12,000 RPM spinning yo-yo sounds a little outlandish to me. Uh, so, but before we go on to really evaluate it, let's see the counterclaim we should see conservation of angular kinetic energy. Here are the equations for that, and here's that ratio now for that. Let's plug in those numbers, and we should get now 20 revolutions per second, which is more reasonable. Um, in RPM, that's only 600. Let's take a closer look at that video and see what we actually got. That's not 12,000 RPM. No, it most certainly was not 12,000 RPM. But was it 600 RPM? What's it doing right here? Seems to me the yo-yo has come to a complete stop. With the mass coming to a rest so quickly, I think we can agree we weren't conserving much of anything in that demonstration. So let's find a better one. There are lots of examples of good physics demonstrations and lectures on this material, but when I searched, I found it difficult to find any really good videos of measurements, quantifiable experiments on this topic. But here's one that was found by the complainant himself. So the theory says, if I cut the radius of rotation down to half, I'm gonna get a fourfold increase in the rotational velocity. Well, let's do an experiment to see if we can get that result. I analyzed the data using some video editing software I got for free on the internet. Now when I did the analysis, I came to the conclusion 
with the rotational rate only doubled during that experiment. So the question is, was the theory incorrect? Have I misinterpreted the theory? Or is my experiment flawed in some way? Good question. I went searching to see if I could find any other videos that we could analyze. I found this one from the University of Minnesota. And here's one I found from the University of Iowa. Now, neither of these videos provided the numbers themselves, but by analyzing the video, I was able to make some estimates. It would be unfair if I left you with the impression that that's where LabRat finished the experiment. No, he continued to refine it and he showed his results. He was able to get the predicted 4.0 by pulling the string much more quickly. His conclusion from this was that the energy losses in the system were minimized by conducting the experiment over a shorter period of time. I don't think that's completely unreasonable. Certainly, we saw that he conducted several experiments and got several different results. One of these did seem to match the idea of conservation of energy, but one of them also matched conservation of momentum. Those other experiments were designed for a laboratory classroom. I wonder if they can do any better. First, let's look at the University of Minnesota's example. They have two balls extended that creates counterbalance, so there isn't the wobbling problem, and the bearings on this device look pretty good. You start the device spinning, squeeze the handle to reduce the radius, and then release the handle again to extend. What I've done is take that video and put it into some editing software, and I've recorded the frame uh, of each half rotation. And then I can use that to calculate how much time has elapsed between half rotations, and from that, what is the angular speed in radians per second. When the researcher squeezes at six seconds, we see a dramatic increase in the speed of the device, and then there's a release that takes place, uh, and as of nine seconds, we've achieved the slow speed uh, once again. There was a lot of variation, as I mentioned, in the fast zone. But if we drop an average across, that would be at the 17.5 mark, or roughly right in between the 15 and the 20. And that lines up with what we see here as well. Next, let's look at the University of Iowa's example. This time, we start with the radius wide again. The researcher pulls to reduce the radius, lets it extend back to wide, back to small again, and one more time back to wide. I've done the same thing, where I've used the video to record the frames, and from that I can calculate the angular speed as measured from the video. And now the final results. I used photo editing software to measure the spacing between the test masses when they're at their widest and at their narrowest, and express that as a ratio in this first column. On the previous slides, I already showed what the measured angular speeds were, and I've expressed that as a ratio here. First, let's look at the University of Minnesota example. In this column, we see the prediction for conservation of angular momentum. And comparing these, we can see that the measured rotation speed is a little bit low. It's low by about 15%. And then when we let the device open back up and things slows down, we see that we are again a little below the prediction, this time by about 10%. So conservation of angular momentum was off in this experiment by 10 to 15% and always a little too low. How did we do with energy? Well, when the device was reduced in size and sped up, we expected to see 1.77, but we got 2.65. So this one's off by almost 50%, and it's too high, meaning energy has somehow been added to the system. And then when we let the device relax again, the energy seems to come back, and we get back our 50% energy back out of the system. Let's take a look at the University of Iowa. The device in question can be approximated as a series of cylinders. There's the long, thin rod in the middle, which we'll call a cylinder, and then the two masses suspended on either end, the ones that move. 
and those are also cylindrical in shape. This is what the whole rig looks like. And this table shows the various dimensions of the device based on a still from that video loaded into some video editing software. All the dimensions are measured in pixels, and that was fed into that equation we had on the previous slide, resulting in these numbers here. The ratio estimate of taking the near mass placement versus the far mass placement comes in as 0 0.269. In the first run of this experiment, the masses start close together and are allowed to move out, resulting in a slowing down of the system of 0.269. Compared to our estimate, we're only off by about 1%. It's extremely good. And then the device is sped up again by moving the masses close together. At this point, we are predicting 3.72 and we get 3.34 being now off by 10%, and the answer is low. Finally, the device is slowed down again by moving the masses apart, and we predict the same ratio of 0.269, and our final run is off by 6.7%. Now, how do these same moment of inertia estimates affect the conservation of energy model? Well, that ratio would be right here, and here are our percentages. As you can see, we're still not doing very well on the conservation of energy model. And you'll also notice that there's a distinct pattern that holds true in all of these experiments. When the device is sped up, energy appears to have been added to the system. And each time the device is slowed down again, that energy is being extracted from the system. That really should come as no surprise. When you consider that in all of these cases, we moved a mass fighting against a force to do so. The mass didn't move by itself. We had to pull on some apparatus, be it a string or, um, or that central shaft, or we squeezed uh, on the squeezatron and applied a force. If we applied a force over a distance, which we did in all of these experiments, then that means we exerted energy. Force times distance is work. Work is energy. So in all of these cases, when the device is sped up, work is put into the system. So it really should come as no surprise that every time we squeeze the squeezatron, the device gains energy and the conservation of energy model really is not expected to hold for this case. Instead, we expect the conservation of momentum model to hold, and, um, and what we've established is that it does a fairly good job. I should stress that all of these estimates are rough ones, uh, and so hitting in the ballpark of 10 to 15% is really not that bad. Uh, furthermore, we do expect the numbers to be lower than the predictions in all cases. And so any estimate that is low really shouldn't phase us one bit. We could take this further by getting a device like this into a lab and performing the experiment ourselves. If we did that, we could measure the actual moment of inertia and not have to rely on these rough estimates. We could also do more rigorous testing to ascertain how much losses there are in the system that have nothing to do with the change of radius. If we did that, we should be able to get a very good sense of the actual torques acting on the system, torques such as friction and aerodynamic drag that we have discounted could be measured and subtracted from the system to get us a better prediction and hopefully better experimental confirmation. I think I've been reasonably thorough and extremely objective in my analysis of these experiments about conservation of angular momentum. There are many more experiments to look at, and we could look deeper into the theory. If anyone finds this all interesting, drop me a note in the comments, and we'll do more videos about conservation of angular momentum and how we can demonstrate that it's true and how we know that it works. I've had this video more or less complete for months now, but I've really been struggling to come up with a way to wrap it up. I mean, sure, if all you wanted to know was is angular momentum conserved, then yeah, we found some videos, we took some measurements, we did the calculations, and it looks like angular momentum holds up pretty well. We compared with conservation of energy 
And we found that in order to reduce the radius in these experiments, we had to apply energy. And we saw that when we compared the energy in both states. We saw that energy had gone into the system when you applied that energy, and the energy came back out when you let the system relax again. Maybe you wondered whether or not the conservation of angular momentum could be demonstrated with a physical experiment. And we found that it could. Perhaps you're concerned that science has become nothing but dogma. Hopefully I've shown here what it looks like to be objective, weigh both sides, find evidence, and go with the results, however they turn out. But something tells me none of this is going to mean anything to John Mandelbauer because he wasn't really interested in this at all. No, John was wrong about conservation of angular momentum, but he has a different lesson to teach us, something that we should definitely pay attention to because this is important. John Mandelbauer wanted to prove that science is wrong. Now, sometimes people get it in their heads that researchers and educators are their enemy. And once that happens, you cannot change their mind by showing them more research or offering them more education. Once you've gone down that road, I don't know any way to turn back. If anyone's got better ideas, please share them. We are facing critical issues as a society today. We're in the grip of a global pandemic that has already claimed millions of lives. And instead of paying attention to the science and the research, we make our decisions based on what political parties we belong to. We do the same thing with climate change. These are very serious issues, no matter where you fall on the political spectrum. There are ramifications for all of us based on the decisions that we make. I can't tell you what to do. I can't tell you what to believe. Because frankly, research shows that won't matter. The only thing that I can come up with is to beg you, please take it seriously. Make a personal commitment. Let's all make a personal commitment to the truth. I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about facts. Facts are not a political issue. Facts are not a religious debate. Let's each one of us today make a pledge for truth. I acknowledge that I may hold beliefs in contradiction with the best available evidence. I pledge to seek out that evidence. And when I find it, I pledge to change my beliefs to match the best available evidence, even if I find that uncomfortable. If anyone has better ideas, I'm open.